With great power comes great responsibility. Imagine you need to use the bathroom. So you go to the toilet and you come out and you want to wash your hands, hopefully. And you put your hand under an automatic soap dispenser, but no soap comes out. Not because there's no soap, but because your skin is darker than what was tested when they made the automatic soap dispenser. How could that be? How could the engineers have made a difficult job of making an electrical circuit, putting an infrared sensor in it, and forget to test it on different skin colours? Well, they probably all had the same skin colour, and the soap dispenser probably worked for them. Imagine this. Imagine you're pregnant, or your friend or your relative is pregnant, and you want to take them to a restaurant out of town. And you get into the car, and you put your seatbelt on, because that's the safety protocol. You know if you had a crash, you'd be fairly well protected. But what about the unborn child? Would the unborn child be protected? As a matter of fact, conventional seatbelts don't fit pregnant women. And a minor crash at 35 miles per hour could cause serious damage leading to fetal death. Seatbelts were designed 70 years ago, but only 23 years ago did the first pregnant crash dummy start appearing. How could that be? Well, there probably weren't enough female engineers to point this out. Hi, I'm Gabriella, and I am the only girl in my applied physics class at university. And that's pretty normal. The UK government reported that in 2014, only 13% of all STEM careers are occupied by women. 13%. While studying, I realized something that I want to share with you today, and it's about people in STEM careers. They're actually designing the lives that we live. What do I mean when I say designing the lives that we live? I mean, the automatic soap dispenser, the seat belts we put on in the car, the phones we use, the heating in our homes, the water that we drink, the way we can touch pay, our banking. And I could go on and on until I've spoken about every different tool that we use and every infrastructure that we live in. Scientists, technologists, engineers, and mathematicians are designing the lives that we live. But as you can see, there's a problem, and I'm hoping that you can help us with that. We need more young people in STEM, and we need more diverse people in STEM. Let's just take a moment and look around. Have a look at the person to your left and to your right and behind you. Everyone here has a different perspective, and that perspective has been formed by our ethnicity, or our backgrounds, our experiences, our gender, our sexuality, our diversity. We need makers that engineer for all of us. And we need people with different perspectives engineering our solutions. The soap dispenser, the seat belt, it's not maliciously meant to exclude people with darker skin or pregnant women. It's an oversight, and it needs to change. So maybe you have a passion for STEM, but you feel like you don't belong. Maybe you're the only girl in the class, like me, or the only non-binary person, or the only Muslim, or whatever it is. I am the unlikely scientist. I am a female artist. Girls don't study STEM subjects, because they feel like they don't belong. Black women don't go into computer engineering because the classroom isn't welcoming to them. But I'm here to tell you that if you feel like you don't belong, you're even more important. 
If you're studying a STEM subject and you feel out of place, you are the greatest asset to our society. So this year, I finished my applied physics degree. And I think I went to applied physics because curiosity is really my drive. And I'm about to start a PhD at Aston University in photonics. I'm going to be working on devices for quantum computing and sensors that can measure down to an atomic level. And last November, we started a new society called WEST. That's Women in, Women in Engineering, Science and Technology, with the aim to engineer an inclusive culture for all. So last term, we had a discussion event. We invited people, female graduates, from different engineering fields to talk about their experiences and how they got to where they were today. And interestingly, one of them was working in construction engineering. And she was working on buildings such as this one, ensuring that the temperature reached the right standard. And it wasn't until we started discussing this did we realize that that standard was based on the body mass of a middle-aged man. In an ideal world, nobody would be excluded from our regulations and our standards and our infrastructures. And things are beginning to change. Let's take, for example, the Uber app. In India, the Uber app now has an SOS button. That's for passengers that are feeling like they're getting sexually harassed by their drivers. We've also got a, a new app now, which is, which is mapping sexual harassment hotspots all over the world, from Delhi to Sydney. But things can get even better. Let's take our public transport. When public transport systems are being designed, they're being designed according to what the most amount of people are using them for. And the most amount of people are using them for work, to commute. But what about people in caring work? Well, traditionally, they're categorized into different, different groups, such as dropping the kids off at school or shopping. But if we put those groups together, we'll find that that's actually the second largest group of commuters. And our public transport should reflect that. Finally, I want to share with you one of the experiences that's probably got me into science. And that was when I was still back primarily painting and doing light design. And I went to New York University on a summer camp. And when I got there, it was like stepping into the future. There were flying drones, there were interactive art pieces, there were mathematicians coding. And I went to a speech about from the, from the organizers of the camp, and they were saying, isn't it great? Yeah, we've got all of these amazing tools. We can have lasers making things. We can have 3D printers printing more 3D printers. But what are we using it for? And then I realized they were looking for ideas. While I was there, I met someone from Colombia. And he was working with kids, underprivileged kids, who lived in shanty towns with no access to electricity. He was teaching them how to code. And they were just fascinated with the fact that they could code and have these LED lights light up and make all these different displays. And they would take this tech back to their plastic sheeted homes and they would light them up in Technicolor displays, so happy that they had power. And they did have power. They had the power to change their environment. They were bringing light to their darkness. We also have the power to change our environment. We also have the power to bring light to our darkness. Now imagine that you are the designers of the lives that we live. Have you spotted an oversight in our infrastructures and the tools that we use? I am waiting for the day 
when I hear a female pilot over the intercom system for, the, for my next flight. I am waiting for the day when sexual harassment isn't commonplace. And I'm waiting for the day when vulnerable people, such as pregnant women, are put at the forefront of all of our transport systems. How can we use the tools of today to tackle the challenges of now? How can we use the tools of today, or maybe even make new ones, to tackle the challenges that we've ignored? or tackle the new challenges that we're now facing. Let's put our heads together and engineer an inclusive culture for us all. And remember, if you're in STEM and you feel like you don't belong, you are even more valuable. Thank you.